Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the IoT and Wearable Meetup, sponsored by Volar Systems. Walt McClay, uh, our president, is here in Santa Clara, and we are delighted to have Shmuel Silverman and his teammate, Nicole, uh, to talk to us about the competitive edge and what is your competitive edge. Uh, Shmuel is going to give us a deep dive into the reasons why this is important to understand your, your differentiating uh, factors and, and beyond. Shmuel, please take, take the screen away and it's all yours. Thank you to the audience for joining us in person as well as online. Thank you. So, Nicole, you wanted this. You wanted to say something, or it's no. Okay. No, go right ahead. All right. Let me present. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm not sure who's there and who's not. I'm kind of like here in um, in Marin County, um, Novato, and um, let's start the presentation first. Just kind of like a little bit about the background for myself. Um, I basically started to look at competitive edge um, when I worked as director of advanced technology and strategy in Motorola. This was plenty of years ago. Um, the problem was that we had a lot of money to create IP, but the question is what kind of IP or intellectual property you want to create and protect um, relative to who competes with you and what is the picture of the future that you're gonna handle. Um, I think we've learned a lot through that process and we've been extremely successful with our IP and, and working with standards at the time. Um, so um, later I just uh, created multi-innovation, uh, founded it and uh, started to do it for everyone, not just uh, large corporations. So competitive edge, you must have it and protect it. Your company future depends on it. Um, let's first understand what is competitive edge. Um, I'm using the definition that came from a book um, written by Hamilton Helmer. It's called the Seven Powers book. And his definition, which I think is fantastic, is your, in theory, competitive edge is a set of conditions creating the potential for persistent differential returns. So it's all about your business, about your returns. So what are those set of conditions that you have that will be persistent over time and create those differential returns. Um, we'll dive into some examples. And if you guys have any questions about it, you know, just raise hand or um, jump in, ask. So the, our first day test case is Kodak. Um, the reason I like Kodak is um, they've been kind of like ruling the market for over seven years. Um, since the um, early 1900 to um, almost 2000 or early 2000. And for them, um, do you guys know what was their competitive edge and how they defined it? Anyone? Well, um, so Codex competitive edge, you know, I can kind of like answer the question for you. Um, at the beginning, I thought that the way they kind of like differentiated themselves is that they thought about the world is that everybody wants to basically um, capture the moment. And the world shifted and they did not notice that the world wants to share the moment. The truth is that their competitive edge was their process of printing. Their printing process was so unique and high quality that at one point they would just give cameras to anyone who wants to um, just so they can print um, using the codec process of printing their images. And image printing um, was um, very physical on, on a paper. So their paper in ink and the process was what the chemistry, what kept them apart. Um, they practically were printing money, if you wish. And once the world shifted and shifted into using digital images, Kodak could not shift with them because most of their focus on where the money comes from, show me the money. The money for Kodak came from printing images. And once the world shifted into something else, Kodak could not shift with them, even though they own the IP for digital. 
they had the first patents in, in that field and, and um, they, they could basically rule that field if they wanted to, but it just didn't work. So what we see is in this case is that a large company that has a specific competitive edge and was focusing on their competitive edge and ruling the market for many years, um, lost the market once they've lost their competitive edge, regardless of their size. Let's look a little bit at IBM. You guys remember the IBM PCs? Yes. You remember. So can, can anyone tell me what went wrong there? Why IBM does not own the PC market today? Because anybody could install Microsoft Windows on their computer. IBM did not have an advantage when it came to the operating system. Say that again. Repeat it for me. Well, uh, One more time. Yeah. Uh, because uh, <coughs> from our, our audience, somebody's saying that anybody could install the operating system on a computer, so IBM didn't have an edge. And also the fact that they opened up ISA. Cards. Oh. They opened the ISA bus, so the bus was open. Well, they, and, uh, the, the audience, Paul said Windows interface as well. So the, the audience are absolutely correct um, in this case, which is hey, surprisingly so. When I ask these questions, most people don't give me the right answers. The answer is IBM gave up uh, what they thought was not a big deal, the operating system. They thought that, you know, operating systems are those, you know, heavy machinery like the IBM 360, 370. And they didn't realize that um, the, the, the cash or the, the, the money is actually in what you put on that operating system and the operating system itself. They gave it to Microsoft. We know where Microsoft is today and we know where the IBM PC is today. So, Odios, thank, Odios, thank you. Um, good answers. Okay. Netflix. So how did Netflix rise to power? Any answers? You know, at the time, Netflix had a big competitor, which was uh, Blockbuster. The subscription model. Subscription model, well, Blockbuster could have stepped into a subscription model as well. Okay. So what, what was Netflix edge that... that um, they were that, online? Excuse me? They were online? No, it wasn't the online because at the beginning it was, you know, you create a subscription and, you know, you pay X amount of dollars and you get your, 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 your CD or whatever it is that you want to, uh, video that you want to play, and you can return it anytime you want. You can keep it for as long as you want. What was the difference between them and Blockbuster at the time? Keep it as long as you want. So... I'll, I'll, I'll help you guys. Blockbuster made money out of penalizing uh, the clients. Penalizing a client, so 40% of their business was late returns. Mm. Netflix noticed this problem and came with a solution. Say, you take a CD. We don't care when you return it. We are not going to penalize you. You can keep it for a week, for a month, and whatever it is. And that's how people started to shift into Netflix because they were not penalized. So they compete on an unlevel ground. The problem for, for Blockbuster was they could not give up that 40%. That was their business. Mm. So Netflix identified at the time what is um, the competitive edge that their competitor cannot give up and took it away from that. Let's look at Motorola for a second. Um, I, since I came from there, um, I kind of like know what's going on. So um, Motorola basically owns the push to, push to talk market um, in the US and many other places, but specifically uh, public safety and other markets. And, and you'll see it everywhere. Um, at the time, I think, but almost 20 years ago, it was a $7 billion business. I'm not sure what's the size today, but it's, it's, it's significant. So how do you own a market like this? Everything is standard. Everything is open. 
You have to share your information. You need to compete in public. Why do Motorola own that space? What was their competitive edge? How did they identify something that nobody else had done correctly? I'll give you, I'll give you a, a hint. Um, when you buy a printer today, you probably pay very little. You don't really pay the cost of the hardware that you are paying for. I mean, I have a printer in my office that I think we paid 90 something dollars for. And, and I think the, the, the manufacturing cost into that printer is probably much higher than that. Or at least very close. So what Motorola did and most people don't know is they gave up practically gave up their infrastructure. But the infrastructure was designed for a higher quality mobile. They can have better coverage with smaller footprint of infrastructure. So when competitors showed up, which is basically um, um, radio, radio sensitivity design, both on the base stations and on the mobile, so when the competitor shows up with their mobiles and their sensitivity is not high enough, they don't get, they don't get the good signal. And of course, the police department, whoever is doing the test, coming back and say, sorry, yes, your mobile is cheaper, but it doesn't give us the coverage that we need. And it's a problem for us. It's a problem because if you want to add antennas or add base station, the cost of them are horrendous. You do not want to add base station. Um, and, and antennas in your system. So by giving up um, the infrastructure for a much lower cost, um, um, but also build an infrastructure that requires um, higher quality radios, um, allowed Motorola to control their market, even though it's a standard base. So when you design your products, you start to think about, is there anything in my product that I can just give away? That it's okay, I'm going to lose money on it. But over time, I'm going to make a lot of money as a result. So giving something away, um, giving freebies, like Google, giving freebies um, gives them a market. And it, it is a strategy and a competitive edge. Um, let's talk a little bit about pharma and after that we'll jump into IoT. So what is the competitive edge with pharma? How pharma gets competitive edge? Anyone? I mean, you all know the answers for that one. That's an easy one. Okay. If nobody jumps in, pharma gets their competitive edge from patenting. So there is a process, a long and horrendous process that is called creating a patent for you. And um, during this process for pharma, they also get all sorts of um, freebies from, um, from um, the US government and other governments. And those freebies are way beyond the just standardization. Um, it's, um, it costs about 200, um, about $200 million to actually create a drug. Um, it's not that much different than creating a new processor, a chip or something like this, but it's about 200 million. And most of it is not through just the research, but also verifying that the product works. And the way to protect it is to create a patent that after 20 years you can, or 25 years, you may get generic for, but until then, whoever owns that product owns that market. So competitive edge in pharma requires huge investment upfront uh, to create the product, but also um, some investment on protecting it and patent. So that's for pharma. Let's talk about things that are a little more down to earth. So what is the competitive edge here? Or can we, what can we do to, have, to get a competitive edge for this specific device? Anyone? No thoughts? Any idea? I mean, anyone is you know, creating devices like this? 
in the audience? No? So this is pretty hard in terms of um, competing. Um, most of the time it would be on the material, but I'm not sure if it will truly give them a competitive edge because here are the other slides. So look at the competitors. So for example, if you wanna go and just patent what you have in terms of design, then you'll get a design patent and that's fine but it does not yet prevent your competitors from coming with a different design that could be as effective or look really great and, um, and compete with you. They will also use different materials and will try to protect their materials in that case. But any ideas how to handle competition in these cases? Very quiet. Okay. Paul D'Souza suggests patents in marketing. Patent in marketing, yeah. I um, again, let's if if Paul, if we go to the um, if we go to the definition, um, it it means that um, in order for you to sustain that specific competitive edge. Patenting will work well, but as you see, it's almost very easy to create another device and compete with you. Um, on the marketing well, side, was it by working through chiropractors? Uh, that might be a competitive edge if you can get some kind of a deal that chiropractors um, um, having um, relationship with you, either financial or not. That, um, that encourage them to use your device as opposed to other devices when they recommend to their clients. So a competitive edge in this case is uh, the go your go-to-market strategy. The patenting side goes without, almost without speaking. You have to protect kind of like the look and feel and the materials that you're using here. Um, but beyond that, um, you may even create a device if um, you add sensors here, and of course it becomes more, more expensive, and you use your sensors to help somebody um, realign themselves correctly on the pad, then you can create a competitive edge by how the pad is interacting with somebody's neck. So here's a freebie invention for you guys because I haven't seen it in the market. What if those dots here um, would basically give feedback by either buzzing or doing something um, on my neck such that I can align myself correctly. At that point, you've got a device that fully differentiates itself in the market. It might be a little bit more expensive and you need to figure out how to, how to handle the expense because these devices are very cheap. It probably costs a dollar or two to create a device like this. Okay, next step, back pain. <laughs> Yet another device that's absolutely an IoT device. It is communicative. It's attached to somebody's back. It looks like it's going to talk to their whatever device. And what do you think about that? How would you create a differentiation here? How would you compete in this market? What is your competitive edge here? Besides chiropractor. <laughs> well, whatever the answer that you think in your mind, it's, you know, I just want to bring up the next slide so you can see, um, you can see your competitors. So this device is much smaller. I still can't figure out how people are touching it to their back, assuming it's adhesive, but I don't see any kind of like, um, how can you put it in the right place? Like physically attach it exactly where it should be. Um, but it looks cool. It's a nice device. So their competitive edge would be where we look better. Um, we're much smaller. We are a better design. Uh, who knows about placement? Um, 
Any thoughts? And kind of like the reason I bring it is because it's not, it's not that simple. It's not that easy every time to truly figure your competitive edge. You need to understand your competitors. You need to understand the market. You need to understand pricing. What's your go-to market strategy? And you need to ask yourself, where's the money? How do I really make money out of this? So if somebody did pay, you know, purchase my device, where is the money? Is the money in the device or the money in the service that I give them based on this device when they are connected, when they're connecting to my system? How do I encourage them to connect to my system such that it's helpful for them, um, give me good feedback and also um, generate some continuous, um, continuous income for me? And what do my competitors doing in that space? So these are kind of like tough questions that you need to answer. How about this device? I'm sure you guys know this device. This hoverboard is like one wheeler hoverboard. How would you protect this device? What is your competitive edge in this device? Why would someone choose to use this device as opposed to something with multiple wheels? And how are you going to protect it? Any ideas? I hear sounds from the background, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait patiently. Okay. Rio, was someone saying something in the audience? We, we couldn't quite hear. No, we, we weren't saying anything in the audience. Okay. Oh. So, um, so obviously you want to com com in order to prevent competitors from entering your space and because you believe that your um, what you've created is extremely unique. What you want to protect is the principle of using one wheel and one wheel only in an overboard. You also want to probably protect the ability to create multiple wheels aligned in the center. So it's not just one, it could be two or three here that behaves as one. And the reason that you want to protect it is because even with, um, with a one wheel, um, if I want to turn in, in through uh, around my center, um, I could actually have three wheels here instead of one and basically move the two outside wheels uh, independent of one another. And by the way, if it's not patented, you guys should go ahead and do that because here you have the product that can actually compete with this specific hoverboard because they did not protect, if they didn't protect it. I don't know if they did or not. I mean, I didn't check. I'm just offering other options for creating the same device that deliver the same feel with some new features that this device may not have um, and um, basically take the market away from them. I hope I'm not hurting anyone by saying that, but you know. No, no, not at all. It's, it's so, very important. And it's a, it's a direct question that's uh, entirely appropriate. So when, when, when we look at a device like this, and I know, um, you know this device was invented, created, and, and I think some of my friends were actually involved in that, um, um, maybe even some in the audience. And the, the, the thing with this device, again, when it was protected or the way to protect a device like this, if your competitive edge is that you have this one center wheel that does it, you want to protect not just one center wheel, you want to protect the other options of solving this problem, even though you're not necessarily uh, think they're cost effective at this at this point of time, and you're not going to develop. Them. So protecting your competitive edge when it comes to IP, 
you need to be very smart about it. You can't just go ahead and protect exactly what you've created. If you do that, you're basically setting yourself for failure and for competition. So uh, we have a, a couple of raised hands. Uh, Please, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Paul D'Azusa, are you, are you uh, able to, to share some comments? Yeah, I was muted. I just got unmuted. Good. Hey, Shamil, good to he see you and hear you. It's been a while since we spoke. Yeah. Um, so, hey, I got a question. So, you bring up a good point with this one wheel and three wheels. My question is specifically around the competitive edge, around form following function, right? Yes. <laughs> so, this big wheel is one way. Okay. It's one wheel versus the other models and because it's a thick wheel and not what you suggested two or three you know maybe smaller wheels or finer wheels that's one thick wheel maybe they can protect themselves and have a competitive advantage because it's good for off-road right you see these guys running through the woods with this if you had you know smaller thinner wheels even two or three they may not be good in the woods, but they may be really faster and good and more easy to use uh, better experience on the road, going to the office or in quotes on the mall or in a much more smoother city based uh, usage, if you would. Yeah. What are your thoughts on sticking with the competitive advantage around function and then linking the form to that and saying that's our competitive advantage? Yeah, so in, in um, my mind, even specifically on that, I can design those wheels to be close enough um, so you don't really feel, you, you're not going to have much difference. What I like about this wheel, obviously, part of it is that it's probably nicely squishy. So when you go over rough terrain, um, it may give you a smoother ride. Um, and yeah. what um, a way to do that when you have few wheels um, is also to allow them uh, this level of squishiness. And when you go over rough terrain, I would actually automatically attach them inside. So I would have a bolt that goes inside to connect all the wheels together for off, for off terrain. And then when I'm on roads, I would allow these wheels to, um, uh, this, this kind of like bolts to move, to move back um, and um, between them. Um, that's kind of like, so you can, you can sometimes provide some mechanical settings or mechanical solution into your invention. So it's electronic, but when you, um, when you want to get a smoother ride off road, you just put kind of like some, some bit that physically attach those wheels together. Um, so that's first. The second, um, when you, every time, no matter what, when you have a product that you protect using IP, you must cover all options. You cannot, I mean, if you cover only one option that is, and that helps you with off terrain, uh, with, with, you know, harsh terrain, as opposed to go on roads, um, then you, you exposed yourself because now I'll go and create a device that is more effective on roads. And I'll say, you know, most people who buy, who will buy that at that point will not be necessarily teenagers who wants to run um, and, and, you know, go on trails. So I agree with you, but at the same, um, I hear you. But at the same time, um, competitive edge cannot um, cannot be narrow. You can't look at it very narrow. You have to look at it broad. Cool. All right. No, thank you. This is a great topic. I appreciate the insight because it, it makes a huge difference, right? I mean, there are brands that have identified that have built their brand on. <clears throat> You know, in this case, if you take motorcycles, right? Yeah. <coughs> I used to ride Ducati motorcycles. In the entire Ducati line, there, was, there wasn't a good off-road option, right? Only now they got the scrambler. And then you take, there are so many other lines that Yamaha and all those guys that had phenomenal off-road options and then phenomenal street options. And those products are very different, but they stayed in their swim lanes. So there was a certain element about saying, hey, you can build competitive advantage around form and function. And I'd made a comment earlier about marketing. You know, there's a combination. And we talked about the chiropractors. There's, 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 the, there's that intersection where you do form and function and marketing or your go-to-market strategy and you can build a niche because the competitive advantage, I think, you know, what's missing for me or, you know, the way I look at it is, is what are you trying to accomplish? What is the size of this marketplace that you're, you're trying to protect? 
the only, that's the only valid, valid reason for competitive edges to grab market share, right? It's, As an, that's an assumption I'm making. It's not only um, getting market share. You can get market share very quickly. The question is how you maintain this market share for long Right, 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 right. So the long, long periods of time. Correct. That's what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. It's not just accessing the one time, but staying with it, right? How do you stay in that edge and build that brand so, around and stay in the market? And, and you and so actually let me leave this to the next question and then I'll shut up and give other people a chance. Is where's the role of marketing in this narrative of competitive edge? So the, or your go to market strategy. You always, you always, so competitive edge in order for it, in order for whatever you've identified as competitive edge to work long term, you need to kind of like guess what is the picture of the future. So, in this case, um, for this specific device, you can have a go to market strategy saying, okay, no one solved the off road very well. This is off road awesome. I want to solve it. And here's a solution for it. So my first thing to do is because I'm so I'm differentiating myself so well as off-road just to get my first 70 to 100,000 devices out there, sell those, get into the market so people start to see me raise some money and move forward as, as I do this one turn. What's my next step? So the go-to-market is important because if your market is not only off-road but also on-road, you do need to think about it up front. You need to say, here's how I go to market and here's what I need to protect seven years from now and 10 years from now. This is where my competitive edge. In this case, the reason I brought this specific one wheel is because the competitive edge is obvious. It's a one wheel. They, they have to somehow protect the fact that they are one wheel in the center. But I call it one wheel. It's not one wheel. The one wheel could be a combination of wheels in the center and it would still be protected. And they need to think about it or should have thought about it um, 10 years ago when they created that specific thing. And again, mind you, I never looked into their prior art. I don't know what the status there. I'm, I'm just saying, had I, have I been there, this is what I would have done. I would actually create those multiple options, on-road, off-road, um, physical clicking and connecting things or not, and making sure that all of those at least protected in IP, even though I'm not developing it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I get it. I get it. Like you're saying, it's not a one wheel. It's really single axle, right? Because Exactly. The axle. It's the single axle system. But I'm not sure. I think single axle system would be too broad, but I, I'm, I'm sure there, there are other fine things. Um, and there are other differentiators uh, further inside of it because of the manufacturing. So where's the engine? Is the engine inside? Is the engine on the edges of the wheels from both sides, from one side, et cetera? There are all sort of um, variations, uh, but all of those can be captured in a single spec. And then you can generate multiple patents out of that specific spec. You just need to get this spec, one spec out there as a provision of ASAP once you get the idea. Got it. Cool. Other questions, please. Uh, let's see. Anyone from the audience here would like to ask any any additional questions regarding? Uh, oh, welcome. Hi. Introduce yourself. Oh, Michael. Michael. Yeah. Please, please meet. Uh, uh, please meet our, our presenter, Shmuel. Uh, we're talking about the competitive edge. Thank and Hello. Michael, just a little brief introduction to, to yourself. Um, I'm a startup. Uh, I'm working, uh, I was working in data over science, uh, working on a wearable device. Data over science. No, data over sound. Data over sound it, it for very scientific. <laughs> for very scientific, uh, a startup, yeah. and and for you. Well, wait a minute. So what's uh, what's the resolution? Um, what's um, um, how many beats can I get over sound? Because sound is a very um, slow medium. Uh, slow work for us. We were going to do it. Uh, I was targeting over the air. Um, and the, the, the bits range from a couple of hundred 
up to maybe a, a thousand per second because uh, we wanted to stay under um, 20k hertz. Um, okay. So, so, so that the device could be compatible with mobile phones. So yes, yes. So you're and you you're you're going to use um, um, frequencies that not necessarily we can hear, or or frequency that we can hear. Uh, the industry uses both. Um, there's, um, I mean, it could be it could be like audible, like the modem, phone modem. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I have an example here, but you know, it could be audible. It depends on the use case and how you want to apply it, right? And uh, it's over the air, so you know, if there's a lot of ambient noise, it can it can uh, you know result in uh, some uh, data loss and things like that. So, okay, do you use? Um, I'm I'm, ass I'm assuming you're using um, multi. You know, I'll call it I'll call it MIMO, but um, I'm assuming you're going to use MIMO and beef, beef, um and and also beamforming. I didn't get all of that. I'm sorry. I'm going to use what MIMO, MIMO, which would uh, be um, multiple multiple receivers um, in a single device, and also beamforming. Um, when you transmit, you want to create a beam in a specific location. So you get a much higher resolution in a specific location. Um, we looked into all of that. Uh, I was personally focused on, as a startup, more on solving some use cases. The uh, those, um, you know, strategies and techniques are available in the industry, and it depends on the use case. And I was targeting. Uh, to be uh, have a wearable device or a fob uh, that could act as a key in lieu of a NFC or RFID tag to identify the carrier of that fob, or having the app on the phone and have it talk to a you know a receiver at, within a one meter range, one to two meter range. That was a use case I was trying to solve. Fantastic. Now ask ask your question. Now I really under, I do understand what you're doing. So now now please ask your question. Ask my question. Yeah. What's your question? Um. Uh, in in general, I, I would say you know how I mean the the over the air aspect. You know, in an environment. So I would say, what what could be the the optimal, the better, or the I, idealized uh, technique to do one to two meter distance uh, over the air? Uh, you know, under the twenty k hertz uh, frequency range. So beam forming, all of that. From your experience, you know, you can tell us maybe what are the, some of the areas that you think we we could focus on a little bit more. Well, I've I have to you know I tell you I mean the um, I've got patent on the radio side on the radio frequency, and I've got patents that or inventions um, that um, that I've done with uh, uh, um, LiFi. So I've invented the the um, the multi sector sensor LiFi that um, um, that basically I can I can listen to um, multiple. I can get information from multiple transmitters at the same time in multiple directions and and and, and work at 360 and not not be um, 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 not be limited in my directional um, direction on Wi-Fi. So, I've done it with light. I've done it with radio. I've never done it with with sound. I I'm not sure um, the problem. I mean, there are multiple problems with sound, and I'm not. Uh, that's I'm not an expert in that specific field. The question for you is is basically different, and and uh, my apologies that I'm not answering your question on how to design it better. I'm not giving you that expert opinion right now, but I like to focus back on the competitive edge. What is your competitive edge? You're creating a device, going into a market. You're solving a problem. I believe, and what is your what prevents somebody else from solving that problem 
doing it maybe not as good as you, but close enough and compete with you in that market and take this market away from you? Um, that is a very good question. Uh, I have some uh, methodologies that is in stealth. Um, and, you know, the, the tech, I'm being agnostic to the technology itself. So it's the use case and targeting and applying some proprietary methodologies that I've come up with to address that use case. So usually a, a use case would be, I would uh, contactless and touchless talk to my browser with my phone and log on to my bank, you know, from one to two meters away. That's a use case um, that I was targeting. That, that, that's fantastic. Um, I, I would encourage you to think about other ways to solve this use case with other technologies compare the um, whatever is the numerical information associated with those different or other options. So your picture of the future is as follows. I'm coming close enough to some device and I'm able to communicate with that device from two meter away um, without using a radio or without using something else. And you basically took or eliminate some things from your picture of the future. But what you want to want you want to ask yourself is what if um, what would be the solution if I used uh, Bluetooth? What would be the solution if I use this or this? What are the existing solutions that are actually doing that already? Um, what 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 is their success in the market? Yes, no. Why are they successful? Um, then you need to solve the security issues associated with the fact that anyone can hear what you are communicating in that distance. Um, very close because if it's going, if it's sound waves, it's very easy to, to listen to. Um, and so there are like multiple subject here before. Um, so even if you identify the market, you want to make sure that this market absolutely prefer using sound and not any other medium to communicate. And then assuming that they do absolutely and just sound, that you have captive audience, now you want to differentiate yourself from any other sound device. But as long as your, cap, your market is not captive around sound only, and there could be other solution, you must figure out all the other options, not just show that you are superior, but also block them from getting into your space. Because even if you're superior, um, subpar options, might be more cost effective for people and they will go with that and your market will shrink. Raymond, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, please share uh, your yeah. comments and, and questions and, and uh, what your competitive edge is or, or, or direct questions to Shmuel. This is a golden opportunity. Sure, Rio, I, uh, do you hear me, Shmuel? Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you. Oh, oh pretty, very good. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for this great presentation. I'm actually working on something that later I will be discussing with Walt, and that has been a little bit difficult for me to find the uh, competitive edge because I, as an electronics engineer, I thought that if we put more technical stuff in something, in a product, that makes that a competitive edge. And... I uh, will hopefully looking forward to discussing that with you later on. But for now, regarding that hoverboard, you were asking what is the competitive edge? I think not from the uh, marketing standpoint, but this one, it is not for, this is made for kids, is not made for elderly people. So it's just focusing on a group, you know, or age group, young people. These are the ones that love to go and get that one. So can that be a competitive edge? A subgroup that you focus on, um, uh, again, the group itself is not a competitive edge. Your competitive edge is that this group would favor something specific that you continuously and consistently deliver to, for them. So they want specific experience. 
you have this specific experience with your device. Your competitive edge is delivering this specific experience and preventing yes. everybody else yes. to deliver this experience using other tools. True. So as long as you can consistently deliver that, so, you know, the world is divided into, I think, zillion ways, but let's divide the world into two. When you have a huge market and when you, um, and you're already present in a very large market, let's say that you've got 5 million users for your device. Right. That's one you need to, at that point, uh, you think about competitive edge in much broader way than when you start from zero, when you're very early in your stage. When you're very early in your stage, your competitive edge is, I deliver something or an experience to my customers, my client, my user, whoever buy my device that they cannot receive anywhere else. And then what you do at that point, you either by yourself or you sit with me and figure out how do we own the experience? Yes. Not the technology, the experience. Yes. Okay. And if there are five different technologies that can give us this experience, we would like to create a portfolio that own the experience in all those technologies. And even though, you know, the, furious, the previous speaker uh, the, um, um, asked me about um, what do I do with uh, communicating data over sound, which is great, but what is the experience or what is that your users are going to pay for? And then look for how are there other means to deliver that experience? And if so, you want to create a portfolio that own that. And if you cannot expect competition galore, assuming you're very successful, if you're not successful, there won't be any competition. But if you're very successful, Everybody will compete with you, and they do not need to use sound at that point. Um, same thing for you, Ray. Um, right. Look at the experience that you're going to provide, not necessarily the fact that you have a better technology to provide this experience. What is the experience that you provide? And now we need to look at all of those technologies and prevent them from delivering that experience if we can, or create a a, a higher barrier to entry for that. And if we cannot, we do not really have a competitive edge. We have, we have a, a moment in time to be successful, and this is not a long-term play. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Tom, would you, would you like to share some feedback or questions? Hello, Tom, can you hear us? Hi, Leon. Are 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 you able to chat with us? Can you hear us? You're uh, you're on mute. Hello, Fred. Are you able to hear us? Anyone else in the audience that would like to to share or ask a question? I have a question. <clears throat> I have a question. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's in general, but it, it talks about something coming up with a solution that you think uh, or something that you see to, to add a gap in the market that you think you see, but it is totally different than, you know, what's existing strategies and technologies are even addressing that need. How do you try to, uh, you know, come up with some way to validate your thinking process um, like that? I mean, the quick answer would be, you have a solution in search of a problem, but if you do believe you have a solution, which is kind of radical, but it's important, how can you, what are some of the things you can do to validate from that point? Um, so on the, uh, the validation side um, and what I usually do with um, both my clients and for my startups, I currently, I currently have my own two startups beyond um, multi-innovation. Um, 
what I usually do is I check the market. So I've got a few people whom I contact and they create kind of like a group. They bring potential clients in the potential uh, subset group, whatever it is, and present to them in like in as on paper, here's what we're going to do for you. Does this really work for you? What, what are your pain points? What are you looking for? What, et cetera. Many times, and I, um, um, at least with one of my one of my startups right now that we are in the process of um, uh, going into funding very soon, um, I I was surprised. I thought the market wants X, and I was so happy about this X. I was going berserk, designing, planning, you know, <laughs> spending a lot of time with engineers, and I come back and then we we check the market, and boy oh boy, uh, what the market needs is something very different. It's in in, in, in the right trajectory, but it wasn't what I was planning to do. Wow. You have to talk to people and not talk to your friends and not talk to the people you know. Talk to people that you're absolutely sure would want to buy this product, not because you're a friend or know you. To the contrary, they want to buy the product because they're going to see a lot of value in it. It's valuable to them. And then ask them, what do they see? Because they have some solutions that they're using today that you think are subpar, are not good, according to your personal experience. Don't be biased by your personal experience. Allow others to share their experiences with you. And then you need to ask the, 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 the biggest question is, you need to check the willingness to pay and the willingness to give up on what they're currently using as their solution. So if my current, let's say, currently I'm using an electrical shaver, whatever it is, let's say I'm using electrical shaver and, uh, but I really, you know, I like to um, run, it, run it underwater. And let's assume my, my electrical shaver does not run underwater. It's really hard to clean. These are all the issues that I have, okay? But I'm using it for now years. I'm really used to it. And you come with those, this awesome electrical shaver that I can run in water. I can be in shower. I can drop it in, 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 the, bath, in the bathroom and it will be fine. Nothing happens. So it continues to work. And you come to me and say, Shmuel, look. Um, I know you're using this, you know, shaver that you bought 15 years ago for 15 bucks or whatever, or, or $200 at the time. It was the best thing in the market. Here's a new shaver that can make your life awesome. Give you an experience that you don't have. Would you pay $200 for this shaver? Or what would you pay? Or I'm giving you this shaver actually almost for free. You're going to pay 15 bucks for it. But every six months, you're gonna you're gonna buy new um, um, blades. New blades for the shaver, and blades will cost you maybe I don't know 15, 30 bucks relative to what you have today. Would you go with that? And you want to get the answer, and you want to have a very clear yes from your test group. And when you get this very clear test, you start to see how the go-to-market is going to be, and what do you need to protect. So. If you're, and let me be very careful and clear about this example. If your group says, we want to pay 200 bucks for a shaver that we do not need to replace for the next 15 years because the blades are so awesome, you have a pat, you have an issue, you have a, um, a major issue in terms of how you're going to protect it. Because a shaver like this, um, A, it's expensive, probably expensive on the manufacturing side. But when you go to protect it, you need to somehow protect the fact that it will be a qual that it will maintain its quality for the next 15 years or 10 years or five years. But you also need to figure to protect um, the fact that there will be shavers out there that compete with you that cost 15 bucks and just replacing their blades every six months. If the answer is we actually prefer the blade replacement on uh, relative to very expensive one, then I would recommend not to even try to protect the very expensive option. Just don't care for it. And focus on <clears throat> figuring out a manufacturing process where you develop a system that the, blade, that the handle itself is extremely cheap 
and you've patented the integration between the blades in your hand hand system. And then because you protected the interface, nobody can create blades that can work with yours. And because your manufacturing process was so cheap, you can practically give away the device. And now people are just paying for your blades. So the go to market strategy and what you're doing with how you go to market will influence your competitive edge and what needs to be protected and defended as you go to this market. So having an awesome device is one thing and I actually discourage people from having an awesome device. What I like to have is device that is awesomely practical and awesomely wonderful for the users, for the, for the people who are your clients. And then I want to protect the, their experience. Now you cannot patent experience, but you can go to the analysis of your competitive edge and figure out what needs to be protected in order for the experience to be maintained and be trusted long-term. We do have well, one comment from Bruce Springer, if we have time. Um, he's got a system that uses frequency following to adjust moods. Decision, should he go with an app or de dedicated iPod-like device? Technology has proven many prototypes, prototypes in the field and he is working on the next generation. And again, can you, can you tell me a little bit about the, about the device? What, what is he doing? Bruce, are you, un, are you able to unmute and give us a little more background? It seems to be a, a system that uses frequency following to adjust moods. To adjust to adjust moods? Yes, correct. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, okay. So that's 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 actually known technology um, or known theory um, where sound frequency, light, um, and others um, um, elements, um, um, other type of frequencies, and either electromagnetic or in sound or in others. Um, can adjust mood and can help people. Um, so a system that does that, I can go through it and just click on it um, on my, if, it's, if, you'll, if you'll have an, an app to do that. Um, it's, it's, it's really nice, but it doesn't yet, um, it's really hard to protect. So you can go ahead and create this app and I can go and compete with you on this app because I think the, the essential technology and a session research not necessarily belongs to you, um, I would guess. I believe that it would be some university research that was done on the subject and there will be multiple subjects, uh, subject matters that, and so, so the, the paper and the documents or whatever, all the publications already out there. Assuming it wasn't patented by other people before, meaning by that university who did the research, um, so, and, or assuming you can just license that, there is still more that can be done. For example, so you ask what to what to go with. If you can do, if you can go with an app to do that, don't hesitate. Go ahead, do it. Uh, but first, figure out if you can protect this in any way. Now, there are kind of like ideas that come to mind. So my apologies. I mean, I, I'm not sure I presented myself well. I'm an inventor, so I do invent for my clients. I do work with my clients. First, understand uh, and figure out their competitive edge, and then invent around it such that we protect it regardless of which technology shows up. So they don't need to be expert in any of those technologies. Um, that's kind of like what I, myself and my team bring to the table. But at the same time, um, with regard to you, some of the ideas that come into my mind right now is I would like to um, this device to be interactive. Meaning, um, I, I'm not just thinking, oh, I'm really sad. I'm going to set this mood X right now and just walk away and let the device make some sounds in my background, even quietly, maybe even um, subliminal, meaning um, it sounds that I don't even hear, but still make me happy or change my mood. That's an awesome solution. Great. But this is just one solution. I would like to have something that... Um, Figure, figures out my mood and that would be your competitor. So your competitor is going to use because, you know, an iPhone or an Android has 
something like 12 different sensors and sometimes more, I know, tons of sensors. Some of those sensors can figure out your mood based on your body language, how you move, um, the sound of your voice in this moment, etc. And over time, I can create a system that can learn what is your current mood, basically guess your current mood quite well. Um, so it could be um, um, a self-learning system. So you don't need to pre-train it even. Um, that will learn over time what is Shmuel's mood. And it will help Shmuel's mood. If Shmuel, if Shmuel wants on the average to have a different mood in his life, it will figure out a different mood in his life. I would like you to go ahead and patent that. That's it. That's my answer for your question. Thank you.